Okay, let's talk now about Egypt's revolution. Mm. First, on a personal level, as an Egyptian that lived abroad and you know knew what democracy was all about and saw the injustice happening in Egypt, how did it affect you on a personal level? Tremendously, tremendously. Uh, it was so heartening uh, to prove the whole world, beginning with many Egyptians, that uh, Egyptians are uh, servile, that uh, they, um, they can't uh, revolt, they can't say no, uh, that they are filthy uh, inside and out. Um, and to see this firsthand and to be part of it uh, makes me proud. In front of giant events like this, you, you, you know, you, you just can't find the right words to describe, basically. You said that when you moved back to Egypt, you had a feeling something was going to happen. In your wildest imagination, did you think that you would see this revolution in the way it happened? Who would have expected uh, that it was going to turn into such a beautiful uh, revolution? You don't have to take my uh, words uh, for it. You take the words of everybody who was watching from outside. Uh, describing it as handsome and beautiful for the first time in the history of the world, uh, you make a revolution and then you clean after you, uh, you finish uh, the job. At the time, the job was to uh, get uh, Mr. Mubarak uh, out. Uh, we thought at the time that uh, it would be enough to kickstart a new era in, in, in the life of Egypt. Um, unfortunately, as it proved later, uh, it wasn't enough, but uh, but it was it was beautiful to to see the Tahrir Square as a as a state uh, in itself. Mm -hmm. It was as if people there wanted to prove something to themselves first that we are not dirty, as you wanted us to be, as you wanted us to feel all these years. Mm -hmm. Not a single harassment case. Not a single uh, person uh, throwing uh, garbage on the street. Everybody uh, into the other. Christians with Muslims, young with old, Muslim brotherhood with a liberal guy. All, uh, all spectrum of the Egyptian society. And they managed it. Yeah. They actually gave the example that they can rule themselves democratically, um, in a very pure, um, sometimes naive, beautifully naive way, um, and to give the example. Mm -hmm. And on a professional level, obviously, that must have, you know, gave a big jolt to On TV and to you. Yes. How did it affect you yes. professionally? Yes. It started immediately because, uh, well, not even those who uh, went out on the 25th of January knew that it was going to turn into that. Okay? So it took a day or two for everyone to grasp that, well, hang on, there's something happening here. Well, the actual uh, serious uh, uh, day uh, was Friday, the mm -hmm. 28th. Yeah. Um, the, as we call it, the Friday of, of wrath, Gumat al Ghadab. Um, that day, <coughs> fortunately, my show uh, used to go out uh, every week on a Friday. Mm -hmm. So I had a show that night, and I had planned to get uh, Robert Fisk of The Independent on my show that day. Because one day before, he came here to my place here, and you know, he called me and said, Yoshri, can I come and have breakfast with you? Um, so he came and, you know, we discussed the situation and we picked each other's brains on what was happening and the rest of it. And I took the opportunity and asked him if he was interested in appearing on my show on Friday mm -hmm. um, uh, with two other Egyptian uh, uh, guests. On Friday, 28th of January, um, security, the cent central security forces uh, were uh, completely defeated. Um, they vanished from the streets. Um, prisoners uh, were getting out of prisons when after they were uh, deliberately open. 
curfew imposed, tanks in the streets, uh, internet down, mobile phones down, and I was there in the, in the studio because I, I started camping there in the media city. Uh, On that Friday? Yes, mm -hmm. I started actually camping there all the time because oh. I was uh, in and out of the studio every now and then uh, in this bulletin or that program and the rest of it. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it was a bit actually uh, sarcastic uh, that, well, I knew that there was curfew and I couldn't call anyone because mobile phones, even mobile phones were, were down. So I was preparing myself actually just to go and, and, and join uh, our news team, covering what was happening. Mm -hmm. We didn't know how because we couldn't even reach our correspondents. Yeah. Uh, half an hour before I went on air, I uh, found <laughs> my door being open in my office and, and there was uh, Robert Fisk. Yosri, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, I'm impressed. How did you break the curfew? I said, yes, I like it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a man that's, you know, uh, uh, someone like Robert Fisk with all the war zones that he covered. And uh, it was the adrenaline and the curfew actually gave him more of an urge to uh, break the curfew and come and, and, and appear. So we spent the night together on air, uh, following up on what was happening. Mm -hmm. And that, that night, it was like uh, looting and, uh, and setting fire uh, to, 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 to things everywhere uh, in a very sad uh, scene. Uh, and gradually, gradually, we, you know, we started to make sense of what, uh, what was happening until actually it was for the first time that it happened. It was back on the 28th, that night, that Robert Fisk actually said, Yosri, hang on. This all has been planned. So from that moment on, for the next 18 days, you camped out at yeah, TV? I was there. Uh, uh, all, every, like... Uh, Four or five days, I would probably just come back home to get more, you know, shaving cream or uh, <laughs> whatever, uh, momentarily, and go back again. Uh, uh, you know, I was camping there uh, all the time, uh, living the story, basically. So what was, uh, it? how was it like I, to live I managed it? also to, you know, just have a look at uh, Tahrir Square every now and then, you know, on my way in or, or, or back to the studio. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would have loved to be one of the people camping out there in Tahrir Square. Um, but I, at the same time, I also had a role to play, and I, I hope that I also contributed to, to, to that through uh, my coverage of the revolution. Well, of course, well, you are part of On TV's turning point at the revolution and the very honest coverage. Was that something that the station immediately decided to do on the 28th is to cover the revolution and support it. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, that, that's a very important question. Um, just before that, it was, a th it was I think in the 26th or the 27th that I had this uh, uh, serious uh, conversation with uh, <coughs> Albert Shafiq uh, and Reem Maggit, my colleague, um, deciding on the editorial uh, side. Uh, how, how we're going to cover this. And I remember uh, that I said to him, and we had uh, uh, Mr. Nagib uh, Sawirs on the phone uh, at a certain point after we concluded that, uh, you know, we are um, covering it professionally. We're telling uh, things as they are on the ground uh, courageously. And I asked uh, the head of the channel, Albert Shafiq, uh, to relay the message to uh, Mr. Nagib Sawirs that um, apart from anyone else, if we didn't do it this way, uh, then I'm not in. Um, I'm so proud of that man when he's, you know, he's, he, he said, okay, even though when I said to him, make sure about it that if we did it this way then there's every possibility that it is going to be closed down with a phone call and even with that he said if you guys are convinced and you're gonna play it professionally and fairly then fine they can close it down that was Nagib or Albert? that was Nagib Sawyers wow amazing yes um, 
So chapeau to him, uh, credit goes to him uh, that because in the end he could have said, no, I'm sorry, I can't afford that. And I would have, I would have said, yeah, don't worry, fine, it, this. I wouldn't have taken part. Uh, I would have tried to uh, do my best through uh, any other means. Um, the least of them is that I would have just gone to Tahrir and, and, and just become one, one of the people in Tahrir Square. Mm -hmm. uh, but he gave me and he gave my colleagues the opportunity to uh, present reality to the best of our knowledge, fairly, objectively and professionally and patriotically. That's great. Well, obviously he made the right decision because on TV became known as the station of the revolution and you gained so much power and influence in the fact that you even started to shape politics as with the famous episode with the former Prime Minister Ahmed Shafi. Yeah, that came a bit later uh, on. Um, mm. Believe you me, I, 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 I didn't even have a minute to think about what this all meant to me professionally or to my career. I just found myself there. It was happening. I mean, it's so easy to look back now at events and try to analyze them and make sense of them. But at the time, you don't do that. Yeah. You're just like you're living the event. You know, what's happening now, we're over the phone with our correspondents or our friends out there. And, at, uh, and you know, people calling you, close friends to you, crying their hearts out because they weren't sure about, you know, where this all was going and, and, and moments of ambiguity that really makes you think and if you didn't really try and, and, and get hold of yourself and, 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 and think more of the scope of, you know, like stay above small details what's, what was happening on a, not, not on a daily basis, basis actually was minute by minute. All, of, all, all what I was interested in is to present as close and as accurate and as honest a picture of what was happening to the people as possible. Mm -hmm. Especially when you look at uh, state-owned TV and, and you see that it was living in a cuckoo land. Yeah. Um, and you look at television. other people, some, yeah. some, some, some of our fellow journalists, they tried to do their best, but they didn't have, probably they didn't have the opportunity that we had with on TV. Mm -hmm. um, and others who were, who fell silent because they weren't sure. Or others who hesitated and, and preferred to wait until they figure out, I don't know what. So you can't really put everyone in the same basket. Of course. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned uh, uh, the ex-Prime Minister uh, <coughs> uh, Ahmed Shafiq. Yeah, that was a night that everybody was watching on TV. And it was the f was for the first time that Egyptians get the opportunity to see such a high-ranking official being grilled live on TV exactly. and a few hours later he resigns so it was it was um, I think that might qualify to a turning point in the life of Arab TV not only uh, uh, Egyptian TV yeah because it tackled concepts that we as Arabs and especially uh, Egyptians uh, haven't really been uh, uh, quite familiar with like accountability. Like no matter how important or how senior you are in, uh, in, in the government that you actually report to me as a taxpayer for the first time in the history of Egyptians that I walk down the streets and I hear uh, a, st a street vendor uh, introducing uh, himself or talking about himself as a taxpayer. That is huge, huge. Those little things that we're not aware of, um, we will look back at, at this and, and, and it's not only about getting a certain official into or out of uh, the cabinet. Mm -hmm. It's about this is the real revolution. The ethics also and the values that were resurrected during the revolution that you feel all of a sudden that this is actually my country now. Well, as you said, that, that was a historic point for Arab media and definitely Egyptian history. Did you know during that moment, during that episode, that you were 
that this <coughs> was a historic moment? Did you have any idea the consequences of that show? In the moment itself, you don't really think of these big uh, concepts and ideas. But certainly, I knew how important uh, editorially that was. Because one day uh, earlier, um, the head of the channel, Mr. Albert Shafiq, uh, had put me in the picture. He said, Yosri, uh, we have a scoop. Uh, Ahmed Shafiq tomorrow is going live uh, with uh, Reem uh, on, on her show. Uh, with uh, Ahmed Kamal Abul Magd and Amr Hamzawi and uh, Nagib Sawiris. I said, congratulations, that's really a huge scoop. Um, and I congratulated Reem and I, you know, I supported her, the uh, tough and the rest of it. When I reached home, I thought about it later. I said, and then I called Albert and I said, Albert, it's a great scoop but I think that the panel is a little bit too soft. He said, what, what do you propose? I said, okay, leave it as it is, because naturally, anyway, Reem finishes her show, and three minutes later, I go into the studio for my own show. Mm -hmm. uh, I will offer the balance by inviting two uh, commentators, um, I didn't have any names then, uh, uh, to sort of like analyze what the Prime Minister would have said. He said, brilliant, you choose whoever you like. And then I, 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 I chose uh, Dr. Alel Aswani and uh, Mr. Hamdi Kandi. Both of them are quite vocal. Both of them are critical of uh, the uh, government uh, throughout, uh, you know, all the last period. Uh, and both of them uh, are credible people with the, with the majority of the people in the street. And that was the way that we wanted. So, and I invited them to come even early before uh, uh, the Prime Minister goes on air so that we can watch together and choose the, uh, you know, the parts of the interview that w they would like to comment on and or elaborate or whatever it is. Um, as it happened, during one of the breaks, uh, during Reem's show, uh, the Prime Minister was going to the, uh, uh, to the toilet and, um, and Mr. Albert, the head of the channel, uh, just threw the idea at him and said, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, if you have time and you'd like to stay on uh, with uh, uh, Yusri's show, uh, you're most welcome. So the Prime Minister, oh yes, of course, I like Yusri, I'll stay on. <laughs> he didn't know what he was getting into. Wow. So you didn't it wasn't know that like it was a critique some people, show. Some people, uh, you know, uh, portrayed it as, you know, it's, it was a conspiracy and things. And when you say something like this, you're actually putting down the prime minister himself. For me, you know, when I do, whether this or any other thing, so long as the, the person uh, at issue is present, that's it. He can talk uh, for himself. He can present his own view. He can defend his own, his own cabinet's uh, uh, policies or, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Now, having said this, I do understand why it was a little bit shocking for some. Because it was for the first time uh, that Egyptians and Arabs actually <laughs> get to see such a high-ranking official live on TV and he's being questioned. Aggressively. Like, like he's not... It's yeah. not like, no, well, aggressively in a respectable manner, still. Mm -hmm. Because I dare anyone go back at the tape, and it is on YouTube, and try to single out any word that either uh, or any of my guests uh, uh, said, and, and it's not actually decent enough. Not a single word. No, I agree. Maybe it wasn't the words, but I think even for international by international standards the kind of uh, the the way the comments were said where you don't usually see that being no, done I'll to a you, very I'll high tell you, ranking I'll tell you official. what was really shocking for most Egyptians mm -hmm. well, it's 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 primarily cultural and it tells you good things about us if you walk down the street and you find um, two guys um, fighting one of them is old, and he looks respectable and old. And one is like 20 years old. Without even beginning to ask 
uh, who's at fault and who's not, you would go to the younger guy and blame him. That is, in most cases, what will happen, right? Yeah. You'll be sitting, you know, behave. It's just like your father. What are you doing? And it might as well turn out that this guy, this old, older guy is, is really filthy and, 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 and he's the one at fault. We have this uh, patriarchal uh, culture as well. Yeah. And some people, I happen to be one of them. I share this with Dr. Ala Al Aswani uh, proudly. Uh, that I don't like to be patronized. I don't like anyone to, you know, put their arm around my neck and say, "Oh, I'll come with me. You're just like my son. I'll tell you. I'll make you understand." I'm sorry. Talk to me as I talk to you. What's wrong with that? Don't patronize me. So that's that's what made some people, you know, being taken aback. Or let's not say shocked. Some were shocked, mm -hmm. but. Also, others were just taken aback by the new attitude. There's no contradiction whatsoever between uh, mutual respect and talking eye to eye. You know, you have your job, I have my job. Mm -hmm. Talk me eye to eye. Mm -hmm. You don't have to patronize me, okay? And when I ask you about something or another, and then I, I follow that with, another, with a follow-up question, it doesn't mean that I do not respect you. Yeah. Uh, because... Tell me, when was the last time that in a, an, a, an interview with an official that there was a follow-up question? You ask a question, the agreed-on question, question number two. And follow-up questions, everybody knows, follow-up questions are more important than the original question in most cases. Yeah. And they don't want that for, to happen. That means that they don't accept accountability. When you don't accept accountability, you don't respect your own people. That's what it boils down to in the end.